So I guess uh, Randy told you what the uh, topic was here. Uh, what do you really want? And I'm telling you, that's what I know. That was a little, kind of a hard song to sing along with there. But uh, what do I want? I want beautiful things. I want beautiful things. Now uh, the package of beautiful things is extraordinary, right? I mean, I can. I mean, obviously, maybe a nice piece of art or a nice car or something like that. I don't really think that's the point. We're wanting beauty in our lives, and the way that as followers of Jesus, if if that's who you are here today. Obviously, beautiful things or anything that Jesus touches, anything that Jesus touches. Uh, I, I remember that movie where it, it, everything, well, if you go back to the Chronicles of Narnia and everything kind of gets into the cold winter and everything, for those of you who saw it, and what they want is that something to be touched and then everything to turn back to green. And, and this is a little bit what uh, Jewish men and women would call shalom. It's not just peace. It's like everything seems to be right. Things seem to be ordered. Th seems, things are moving in the direction of orderliness as opposed to chaos. And those are the things that we want. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about in the context of Luke chapter 18. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we need your help as always. Holy Spirit, uh, superintend this time. Lord, I pray that you would uh, enliven us through your word. Me, Lord, right now, I'm, I'm trying to get myself awake here. I'm sorry about that. I'm trying, trying to wake up here and just say, Lord, I want beautiful things. That's what I'm asking you for here today. We know that you are beautiful and that your word is beautiful and that you are your word in a myst mystical kind of strange way. Lord, you can come and invade our lives and begin to order our lives in such a way that it reflects your glory and makes us content, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, Luke chapter 18, verse 35. Luke chapter 18, verse 35. Many of you will know this story, or have at least kind of, uh, you're able to hearken back to the story, sometimes called blind Bartimaeus. Now, Jesus was often healing the blind and the lame and, and the deaf and the, and the dumb and all that. And so what happens here is a specific man and I think we can draw a lot from the story. So I'm going to read the story and over the next two weeks we're going to look at seven different aspects, seven different takeaways that I get from this just seven verses here. So seven takeaways from seven verses. Are you ready for this? Do we need a seventh inning stretch already? I know it's kind of, you know, we've, uh, so I welcome you and here we go. Are you ready? Luke 18 chapter 35. As Jesus, as Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was passing by. Well, then he started calling out and saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. And he asked this simple question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, okay, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well, and immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Now, oftentimes this story is told in the context of healing, God's ability to heal. We'll look at that a little bit more next week. Uh, there's no question that this is a, a, a beautiful reference that God, by his stripes, we're healed and some people say God's kind of done with that, and some people say, no, if you have enough faith, even today, you can still be healed, and somewhere, is it somewhere in between, and there's just God's answering prayer, but it's not always yes, be, but he's, he, here he says, be it done according to your faith. It gets a little complex. I've prayed with great faith at various points in my life, or at least what I perceive to be great faith, and people were not healed. There are people in my life right now, right now, that are very close to me, close relationships, and they haven't been physically healed. And, and I'll be honest with you, and, and it's hard to get up here and preach about, of course, if you have enough faith, Jesus will heal you. And, 
and you want to kind of slide back into that place where God's kind of done healing people. That was really to authenticate his ministry and to show that he was the Messiah and he's not really into healing anymore. And yet I've seen God do the miraculous in healing. And I always say it's somewhere in between for me. I, I, it's not exactly like it was back then where they could just go and pretty much everybody they lay hands on. They were taking, they were taking little pieces of cloth and uh, they were taking that Paul had and, and people were being healed by just touching that. And uh, TV preachers do that today and, and all that kind of thing. Or not all TV preachers, but some TV preachers do that and they, they will send you a little oil or a little water that they got in Israel from the Jordan or something like that. And they call it miracle water and all that. I'm not so sure about all that. So it doesn't always look like the stories that I see in the unpacking of the book of Acts, but I am not willing to say that God is not still healing today in the 21st century. But that typically is how this passage is approached. That there is, but I wanna look at it in a different way. I wanna construct in your mind over the next two weeks, two weeks a little bit of a template about how our first engagement with Jesus happens all right are you with me so i want there to be i think a lot of these encounters that jesus has you know we don't we have precious few specific encounters we have the woman at the well we have the roman centurion we have obviously his encounters with the disciples when he says drop your nets and follow me or drop your tax collecting good you know your gear there and follow me we have a little bit of that but we're, we're we have precious few encounters with jesus and so because we have these, I want to always try to just wring everything out that I can and see if there is a consistency in the way in which God deals with us. And I think there is, and we'll see a little bit of a pattern emerge again over the next two weeks. Okay, first of all, as Jesus was approaching Jericho, now if you don't know where Jericho, Jericho today is a model, modern, what we, you know, we call that, that area that's so fought over the West Bank. Jericho is actually inside the West Bank. It's actually inside the borders of Israel proper today. There's a little strip on the, on the eastern side and that is uh, bordered by the Jordan River that goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. And then if you cross the Jordan, you got a little bit of Israel there and, and then all of a sudden you hit the West Bank. It's above, it's north of Jerusalem, but it's in between Jerusalem and where Jesus would have been coming from, which would have been Nazareth and or Galilee area. And so he's making his way down south. And uh, we understand because this is getting close to, well, his final Passover where he's going to become, as we looked at the last couple of weeks, the Passover lamb, which is profound and powerful. As Jesus was approaching, as I look back over my life, and, I, and, and, and again, I can, tell, I can talk to you a little bit about not only my personal experience, but many of the experiences that I've had with other people. It's as if, and think back about your own introduction to Jesus. Now, some of you say, well, my parents introdu introduced me to Jesus or something, or I kind of grew up kind of going to church and being a follower. Some of you, that's not the case. And you just kind of, uh, you were going this way. You really, maybe didn't even have any spiritual heritage. There was nothing really in your background to indicate that you would have this kind of faith with God experience and then this Jesus encounter. But as he is approaching, as he is approaching, I, it's been my experience to observe and I think about Laura's life and how she began to think in terms of Jesus. She had claimed to be an atheist uh, when I first met her, and yet there were already inklings that Jesus was engaging her heart before I ever met her. I find that interesting. She had done, there were a few steps that she had taken that weren't necessarily that what you might consider, oh, well, she was just all after God. She was still thinking in an atheistic way, but something had happened and it, and it hit me as I was looking at this passage this week. It, this is the as Jesus was approaching stage in her life. I think about the woman at the well. What was going on in the background of the woman at the well? Is she just a daily normal chores, trying to, having to haul this water for potentially miles and she's making her way up to the well, not having any idea that Jesus had been approaching the well. And not just maybe the few minutes or 30 minutes or an hour before that, but I wonder 
what God had been doing in her heart before she actually had this encounter at the well with Jesus. I wonder. I think about Cornelius as an example, who's part of the Italian cohort, the book of Acts tells us, in Acts chapter 10, and it says that he had been giving alms to the Jewish people. And the question would be, why? Did that, did that give us some indication that Jesus, the message of Jesus in his case, literally the approaching of Jesus and the woman at the well, but in, in a, in a, now Jesus has already ascended to the right hand of the Father. Now we have Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Had Jesus been already approaching via the Holy Spirit? Had Jesus already been approaching the life of Cornelius? How about the Roman centurion as an example as well? Had Jesus already been approaching him? It says that, well, Jesus, you really should pay attention to this guy because he's been you know, helping us build a synagogue and things. I wonder what was going on in the heart and in the mind of the Roman centurion as Jesus or the message of Jesus in his case, now literally the approaching of Jesus, was going on. You know, one of the things I think that uh, mistakes that I make is sometimes I feel the overarching burden if there's somebody in my life to lead them to Jesus somehow, save them. And then I have to pull back and go, first of all, I don't do any saving. I proclaim. I can preach and teach and talk to and encourage and love on people. But at the end of the day, I'm reliant today, not on the literal Jesus, but certainly Jesus' spirit through the Holy Spirit, beginning to do work even before you are maybe inserted into their lives. As Jesus is approaching, it's just the case, it's rarely the case that somebody just shows up, maybe here at Church of the Red Door, some kind of group or something. It's rarely the case that God hasn't already been doing a significant work in the heart and in the mind, the hearts and the minds of people who finally then hear a message. As Jesus is approaching, it, it just, I think about it often and I look for indications that Jesus has already approaching someone's life a sensitivity to something you might say. Uh, watching someone all of a sudden turn from a place of uh, lack of generosity, maybe they start doing something philanthropic, or, or they even have a desire to go down and you know, feed the homeless or do something. You wonder, what, what inspired that? There's no evolutionary you know, tidbit in the back that pro provokes somebody to go down and feed the homeless. It's survival of the fittest and the homeless are not the fittest. So it's something going contrary to a materialistic worldview where there is no designer and there's no creative force out there and we're all just a random molecules just bumping into each other. There's, is there indications? And oftentimes I look for those things in others because if I'm going to be effective and fruitful, I want to work where Jesus is already approaching in their lives. Now, that doesn't mean I can't start from what I perceive to be nothing because I don't always see these indications. But when I see somebody kind of sniffing around something or making comments or their lives begin to kind of shift in subtle ways, I go, oh, I wonder if Jesus is approaching and then I get involved. You know, Jesus is pretty clear. And we know in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, this is an often cited reference, and as well it should be, because it says, Behold, Jesus speaking, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Jesus is approaching. You can hear the steps first up the drive there, and then eventually you start to hear the knocking even before you have an encounter with whoever it is on the other side of that door. Maybe you're watching here today, and you're just like, I don't know why I'm sitting here tuning into this or watching this or how I came across this, and yet here I am, and I I think it may be the case in your own life. I feel somehow Jesus is approaching. I've, maybe I've run from it. Maybe I've just denied his existence and somehow it just makes sense to me. And in fact, as you say that and read that, 
I can almost feel in a tangible way a, a knocking at the door of my own heart. And of course, I would admonish you, let him in. Let him in. It's a powerful thought, isn't it? It's really a powerful thought. The second thing that we get, or at least that I derive from this, is that it says a crowd was going by and he began to inquire what this was and they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now there's a couple things. It doesn't say exactly what they told him, but somehow he knew enough, as is indicated by the rest of the story, somebody had told him something about Jesus. He cries out, you know, uh, uh, you know son of David, have mercy on me. How, where'd he get that? How did he get that information? You know, the second part of this as a template, if you think about it, first of all, somebody was there to give an explanation of who this was at the knocking at the door. I'm telling you that it, it, you might be that person in someone's life who's saying, they're saying, I don't know, something's out there. I feel like I'm a spiritual being. I used to think I was just nothing. Now I think I'm a spirit. Somehow there's something in me. Are you implanted like the crowd here? Are you implanted there to give some kind of explanation as to who's on the other side of that door? They can hear the knocking, but there's no, there's nothing defined for most people. If you go out into our culture today, they're just willing to go down any road. And, and I think there's an increasing intolerance for just a purely materialistic worldview. I really do. I think people, because we are spirits and we're, we're souls and we have spirits, I think people naturally thirst for something transcendent, unlike the animal kingdom. Somehow, because people have an intuitive sense that they are created Imago Dei, that somehow they... They, they know deep down that they are different, that there's something, they're crafted in such a way to relate to something that's out there. There's that movie Contact or whatever. I mean, look at a lot of Steven Spielberg's movies and a lot of the popular stuff and all these kind of Marvel's, Marvel movies and all that and the deep comics or whatever they're called, DC comics or whatever, and all these movies, just one after another, they proliferate because they're dealing with some kind of supernatural force. And I think intuitively, we, we, we just make it out to be mythology, but intuitively we sense that there is something out there. There is something knocking at the door. Now, some people go down the road of, well, it's, uh, it's uh, UFOs and it's some kind of uh, extraterrestrial beings out there and, and, uh, and, then, and they just think in very loose terms of the existence of these forces. But, and many people believe in that. Well, I believe in extraterrestrial forces, but I can give much more definition to that. There's an angelic realm, there's a demonic realm, there's Jesus Christ crucified, there's souls that have been, uh, are now in the presence of God because of Jesus and there's souls that are, well, they're already put in prison waiting for an ultimate judgment day. And so, so yeah, there are extraterrestrial beings out there or in a dimension that we can't tap into. I get that. I believe that. And I think most people have a sense that there is something, but they need an explanation. Where do you get this information about Son of David? Is that just inspired by the Spirit? I don't know. It could have been. But they need someone to describe this. This is exactly what Paul is talking to the church at Rome about because he's, his brethren, who said he would lay down his brethren according to the flesh, the Jewish men and women, he would give up his own salvation, he says, if they would just understand who it is that's really on the other side of that door, who the prophets had all been speaking about, but they can't see. There's a veil over their eyes. How will they ever see? They need some kind of explanation. And then he says this beautiful thing in Romans 10, verse 14. In that context, he says, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher. I was teaching on this this week in a men's group. There are preachers, there are teachers, there's you know evangelists, there's all kinds of things. But a preacher is really someone who just heralds, someone who announces something that, a king's edict as an example. A preacher is someone who gets up, 
a teacher is someone that could teach, well, we're doing some teaching right now and I'm doing some preaching right now. There's somewhat of a heralding, there's somewhat of an announcement, but there's also, okay, let's look deeper at this. So two things are happening simultaneously right now. There's preaching and teaching, but how are they gonna hear without somebody proclaiming Jesus is approaching and this is what he's like, at least to some degree, how are they gonna do that? And that's Paul's rhetorical question here. And how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Somebody had described Jesus could have been a week before, could have been a month before, could have been, who knows? Could have been maybe on his way down to Passover the previous year. No, we don't really know, but he had enough information to think that guy is a healer. They at least told him that he had, was healing people. They told him that he was passing by. They told him that he was knocking at the door of Jericho. Hey, he's in our backyard. And he knew enough to know, well, he might be a fulfillment of what the prophets had seen, someone who would come and rule from the throne of David called the Davidic Covenant. Now, that's, that's a lot of information for a guy who was basically relegated to sitting outside and nothing and begging, and he couldn't see anything. Somebody, somebody had some beautiful feet. Somebody. Ever thought about that? Have you ever wanted, aspired to be the person with the beautiful feet? I've always wanted that, primarily because my feet are so ugly. I have some of the ugliest feet you've ever seen in your life. All that, all that disease in my right foot for all those years, and it's kind of gnarled. I got to get up and kind of put some ointment on it in the morning because it's still kind of falling apart. I just I gotta, kinda, have to kind of put it together like clay and put it in these little compression socks and things like that. And eh, it's an ugly feet. I want beautiful feet, but not just literally. I, I, even more so, I want spiritually speaking, I want beautiful feet. I want people, I want God to look down and say, okay, there's somebody I can use. There's somebody will, that will announce the arrival that I'm approaching in someone's life, that it's me that's on the other side of the door. I need somebody, somebody willing to lay down their life to go out and tell, well, those who are blind. I just want to be that person. I've always wanted to be that person. I don't know why. I didn't put that in my heart. But the word continues to to explode when I think about, well, I think about this simple story. And I do think this is a template. What about all those people who were saying, quiet down, quiet down, don't, don't take this thing too far. I mean, are you crazy? Why would they be telling him to quiet down? I mean, I wonder what that is. I, I, I really wonder what prompted that, that this is socially unacceptable, you're driving me crazy, be quiet with all your crying out, he might not stop. He might, he might keep going if you make too big, fu too big a fuss about this. I mean, just settle down, big fella. Whoa, big fella. Back off here, Bartimaeus. I mean, this, this is somebody special. He's coming into our town. You're making us look like idiots. You're making our whole town. I don't know. I don't know what prompted that, but they, they did not like him crying out. It's a little bit what we're going to do at the conclusion of today when we pray. We're going to pray because we're just going to just like, I am unwilling to quit. We're going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to continue to pray. What we learned at the first part of this chapter. Uh, we're going to wear God out, if you will. Just like the woman and the unrighteous judge, if you'll remember the beginning of this chapter. We're just going to ask and keep on asking and ask and keep on asking. We're not giving up. We're just going to ask and keep on asking. Yes, we're discouraged. I don't care. We're going to ask and keep on asking. We're just going to keep at it. And I love that. Well, I love that in Bartimaeus, but I've got to tell you that if that spirit in you rises up, maybe something it's here today, that you have some issue that you just cannot get over this hurdle, that you are like, where is God in all of this? And then you just have to, you have to pull yourself together and be quiet? No, just cry out all the more. It's an indication of faith somehow in my development as a follower of Jesus, 
This is a step that I cannot miss in my own transformation into the very image of Jesus himself. Why is this lifted up in Scripture as being something that's positive? If you have anybody in your life after you kind of gave your life to Jesus and you're like, you know what, you're just taking this way too far. I mean, you guys are, you've gone way over the top. I mean, it's fine to have your personal religion and keep that, and, but why don't you just kind of keep that to yourself? It'd be better because we'd all, it'd make society better if you'd just not be one of those people who's always crying out about Jesus. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? Just quiet down. We're in the middle of a moment, and I think it's a, I think it's a significant moment in our nation's history. I really do where uh, not only the legislative aspects of what's going on in the United States of America today, but it's like just keep that to yourself. It may transcend and go beyond that where people are like, all right, you're in jail. I hope that doesn't come. I hope we don't get to a martial law kind of state like the Philippines did, you know, under the Marcos regime or something like that. I, I hope we don't get to a place that it starts to resemble that but there is a force. What do you think is behind that force? Just privatize it, keep it to yourself. Quit crying out about all this, what you want. Quit crying out about all this. Just be quiet. What do you think's behind that? I have no doubt what is behind that, and I have no doubt about what God wants me to do. He wants me to cry out all the more. Yeah, but that's not very appetizing. It doesn't make us look good. I don't care anymore, <laughs> right? Everything makes you look bad in this culture. Nobody looks beautiful in this culture. We have a strange thing. There's a spirit in America today where it's just, we love building people up and we love to bring them down. I talked to you about it, you know, week or so ago about you know michael block and the pga and 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 he made a few comments that maybe i wouldn't have supported i would have loved to have been his handler and said don't say that michael but he made a couple of comments and then immediately boy they're gonna bring him back down and social media went crazy on you know block fatigue and they called it you know blockbuster i saw i, I brought laura in the other day espn ran a little thing on how he was he, we rose and we put him up on this pedestal and we just brought him right back down. Our culture loves to do that. It loves to keep people quiet. It loves to build them up and then shut them up. Build them up, shut them up. It's kind of the, it's a, it's a caustic way, it's a caustic environment we live in, isn't it? It really is. Politics have gone that way. Business has gone that way. It's just strife and chaos. And anytime I see that, anytime I start seeing pictures of chaos and and just bizarre kind of tyranny stuff, I go, I know who's behind that. We have an enemy. He's the enemy of peace. He's the enemy of the Prince of Peace. If you're the enemy of the Prince of Peace, you're on the wrong side. You are now an advocate of chaos. And I know who the advocate of chaos is. The fallen one, the adversary, which is all Satan means. So are there people in your life right now that are trying to get you just to quiet down? Just be quiet. There's enough. All right, enough of that already. I love this. Matthew chapter 5. Again, Jesus, listen to Jesus' words. Does Jesus want you to keep quiet? Verse 14. Hey, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill. It cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. They were trying to get him to put his little conversation and his cry for what he wanted at that moment under, well, under a little basket. Just keep it quiet. And he refused. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If we are quiet about the glory of Jesus and the reality of who he is not just who he was, but who he is. If we are quiet, 
then we will go into greater chaos as a country and as the world. You are the light of the world. Don't back off. He didn't. Son of David, son of David, have mercy. Shh, be, come on, Bartimaeus, be quiet. And he just got louder. Now, I'm not asking it to be weird or strange or, you know, out, out of order in, in, a, in a social sense. You need to use wisdom. You need to be shrewd. You need to be, take your moments. You need to be prayerful. All those things are true. But at the end of the day, you cannot stop speaking about what has happened in your life if, in fact, something has happened in your life. Now, if, you, if nothing's really happened in your life, you're not going to really care to talk about it. You can go to church all day, but if you say, well, I really don't care about talking about it, then something's not happened that probably should have happened. Maybe a level of faith or a personal encounter with the one knocking, well, with the one knocking at the door. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. Again, who do you think's behind this? When they had summoned them, they commanded them, this is the disciples after their preaching, you know, we had the first, first big sermon in Acts chapter 2, then you had Peter's second sermon in Acts chapter 3, and they're getting pretty upset with these characters. Just shut up. Enough of that. Be quiet. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, well, you be the judge. We cannot stop speaking about what we have both seen and heard. I, I just want to say this. It is radically important that you don't just hear about Jesus and hear about the orthodox principles that will lead you to salvation. Oh, those are important. But you've got to see it. You need to see it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You need to taste it. You need to practice it. You need to put it into action. Because when you do and you see Jesus emerge in all of his glory and restoration and redemption, and well, like the song says, when you begin to see beautiful things break out, when you begin to see those things that were rotting on the vine and all of a sudden, well, they just start popping. We've got some bougainvillea. I don't know if I've pronounced that correctly. I'm sure I didn't, but I can blame it on a little bit of an upbringing in Texas, bougainvillea. So we got some bougainvillea out there in our backyard. And uh, it's all up against this wall. And so we have some windows and, and it's just normally, it just fills, it's like a painting. And, th and then we can see the mountains behind it. It's like this painting. It just adds all this color. It's so glorious. But increasingly as, the, as this bougainvillea get older, they go longer lapses with looking pretty dry and nasty. I don't know if we need some new bougainvillea or what, but all I'm telling you is that more and more this year, I kept coming in, I'd come home, I'd go, Laura, what's going on? Did the world, we're not watering the bougainvillea again? And, and because it just looks so, yeah. It's not filling our windows with art and color and beautiful. I want beautiful things. And beautiful things, when you're dealing with bougainvillea, beautiful things can only happen when there's a lot of this when there's a lot of that being poured all over the roots and, and it gets down and then all of a sudden they can pop. They can pop. I want beautiful things. Jesus may ask, what do you want in your life? I want beautiful things. I want beautiful things. I want relationships to work. I want to have the depth of friendships in my life with circles of people around me who will love me and encourage me and extend me grace. And by, well, by me saying grace, meaning sometimes when I don't deserve it, that somehow I will be extended some grace. I want that in my life. Now, how am I gonna get that? I have to get that. I have to have a vertical connection that is, 
either established and, and I'm continuously establishing it more firmly or if I definitely need to get it established in the first place. I just need it. I, I, I cannot. Jesus was very clear. Apart from me, you can't do anything. I want grace. I want my, apart from me, you can't do anything. So if you're hearing Jesus approaching in your life today, or maybe there's just something that's changed in your heart over the last month, six months, year, maybe even several years, something has shifted. You've gone from being, a, well, someone who t is telling people, just shut up with all that. Enough of that. I don't want to hear that anymore. Just be quiet. You've gone from that camp to, uh, say that again. What, what do you mean by that? There's a God? I don't know if I can go down, but yeah, somehow I've always known. It, there is a God. It's not, just a, it's not just a force out there. It's not just a higher power. It's actually a personable, intelligent mind who's created me in his image? Well, that's different. And then I'll... I, you know, now that you say that, I, there's something in my heart that's like, it's, I don't know, it feels like something outside wants to get inside. I, I don't know how to describe it. And then you, there, there you are as an explanation or there, maybe this serves at that moment. Maybe you're watching and you're saying, this is that moment. I, I now understand what's been pulling at my heartstrings that's been trying to get on the inside of me. I, I, I now understand that, well, that is Jesus. And Jesus comes with what? With beautiful things? I want beautiful things. Well, we have an explanation for that. It's not just a theology. It's certainly not a myth. It's the, it's the historical figure of Jesus, crucified, dead, buried, and on the third day, according to all the prophets, was raised to life triumphantly. And he now, as Ephesians describes, is leading this contingent of, well, people who were enslaved and now who have been set free with him in this, well, this extraordinary procession. And that's what the church should look like, full of the same kind of character and compassion that Jesus has should look like. Are we those people? Do we want to be the people who are the explainers? Do you want to be an explainer? Do you want to have beautiful feet? Are you unwilling to be quiet about all of this? Next week, we're going to look at this idea of total restoration. I, I, I hope you tune in because... I'm going to show you, I'm going to bring a clip from uh, the Middle East about uh, someone who literally got their sight back. And it's chronicled. It's a friend of mine that was on the mission field. And they, they have some video of this. I'm going to show you. But not just for the purpose of saying that God still heals. I do believe that. But for the purpose that uh, we're, we're going to see next week because the next thing we see is something extraordinary <laughs> because and I don't want and I want to close with this and segue into next week with this this is an amazing statement that we see next and it is simply this Jesus stopped right Jesus stopped because I know that the reason I have to pound on the table on this one is because some of you may say, well, Jesus passed me up a long time ago. I'm still in Jericho, and I'm still blind, and my life is not full of beautiful things, and I, but I had my chance, you know, 20 years ago, but here's what I did, and maybe you have a story, and because you do have an arch enemy, he's been whispering in there, shut up, you don't deserve anything. God's already passed you by. No, that's a lie. The truth is that at any point in your life, even you watching this by chance, it may be the case that Jesus is passing you by, and I'll promise you, as the story here so indicates, and we see many other stories,
that when Jesus hears your cry, whether you understand what you're really crying about or to whom you're crying out to, Jesus will stop. Don't ever forget that. Jesus will stop. Not unlike this message. <laughs> this message is now coming to a conclusion. Now the question is, as always, do you believe this? Well, if you do, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come in. You've been knocking. You said, at, what did Revelation 20? Whoever opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In other words, there is a meal that's about to be partaken of. And we'll do that again next week as well with communion. Go ahead and take, drink my blood, meaning not literally, obviously, drink my blood and go ahead and be made right with, well, with a created king, who, uh, the uncreated king, which is God the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Come into our cosmic dance and the blood will usher you in. And now uh, eat my flesh. In other words, if you want to follow me, be discipled. Learn what I say about life and reality. And that's a lifetime chore, by the way. It's a lifetime chore. I will come in and, well, we'll dine together. So if you haven't ever done that, you can do that now. Before we sing our last, you can do that now. Say, Jesus, it's, so it's you, huh? It's, I felt you approaching. I didn't really know who it was, but somebody's explained it to me. And maybe this has made sense to you for the first time. And well, are you going to stop? Not only is he going to stop, he'll come in. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is for those who don't know him. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You said it. It's you who's been knocking. I thought, I've heard it. I just didn't know who or what it was. I might have thought it was a bandit or somebody trying to get in and steal my joy and my beautiful things away. What a lie. I invite you in. Let's dine together. Lord, first I'm going to take the blood of the covenant and I'm going to, I'm going to take it in and I'm going to recognize that I become part of the family based on your death vicariously for me. And now I'm good. You said it. This is, this is what makes me right with the Father. And Lord, now I choose to follow you. I choose to eat every single thing. Like we learned a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to eat the whole thing. Everything you said about life and reality, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to practice it. That's what I want because I believe in the practicing come beautiful, beautiful things. In Jesus' name.